Welcome to CS4510. The topic of today uh, is what's called relativization This is probably one of my favorite lectures in the unit. We basically know very well about how uh, we have shown the diagonalization to be a very powerful tool um, uh, in complexity theory. We've shown that you can separate p from np, uh, p from xp using diagonalization and many other classes, time, space, whatever, of the same resource. So it's conjectured maybe this tool is used among other classes. Perhaps you can diagonalize p out of p space or something. But it turns out, as we'll show, um, you cannot, we can prove today you cannot uh, separate uh, p from np with diagonalization. And you can prove that you can't prove this. Now, I will uh, you know, disclaim that a large part of um, relativization is sort of hinged on a vibes-based analysis. It's not a very formal proof theoretic result in the sense like you could prove like within ZFC a certain proof requires exponentially many steps. Something like this would be a formal proof barrier. This is sort of a, as we'll see in, intimately with this, it's kind of like, it's not obviously wh when a proof has a certain property that we say allows it to not exist. It's, it is a little um, finicky in that regard. Yet it stands and it's, it's mostly unambiguous. And relativization comes from a very odd place. Like you would not think a barrier to a classic problem comes from this, but it comes from the study of something unimaginable, which is called oracles. Uh, an oracle is, do you guys know what an oracle is in general? Like not in perhaps the computer science context? You guys have heard the word oracle? Like a figure that tells you things. Yeah, thank God no one said oracle, that company with the Java, right? They do Java. Oracle is like a, you know, you, it's like a shaman. It's like a, you know, before the computer took all the jobs, you people were employed. They were like the magic eight ball of the village. You would go to them with an offering, and then they would make a, a, a prophecy for you. Uh, and, and, but importantly, it would not be explained how the prophecy was made. There was no explanation about how this occurred. Um, so an oracle machine is one. We'll say M to the oracle, let's say A, such that it ha it's a Turing machine, but it has its normal tape. It can do everything that a normal Turing machine can do, but then it has a special oracle tape. And the oracle tape uh, has uh, this, it has two extra instructions. The Turing machine can write down a query onto the oracle. And in unit time, it'll enter a state and it'll be issued an instruction such that someone else comes along, erases the oracle tape, and, write down, and writes down a one or a zero. Right? So, and that wonder or the zero is if uh, W is an element of A or not, where A is just any language. Right? A can be any language at all. And we will say that a machine has Oracle access to language A if it can be formalized this way. Right? So the original study of oracles was like, with respect to computability theory, actually, I think it was Alan Turing who coined the term oracle. He gave, he was the first person to define this foundation in all aspects, found, uh, a founder of computer science in all aspects. He was concerned, like, if you gave a Turing machine halt, uh, let's say you gave a Turing machine oracle access to the halting problem, could it still decide, could it decide all languages, or do there still exist undecidable languages? Conjecture for the audience. Do we think an oracle access to halt allows you to decide all languages, yes or no? Certainly, you can decide halt. How does this machine decide halt? Ask its oracle, QED. Um, can an oracle machine decide? Are there still undecidable problems for each oracle machine, for, for this oracle machine? Why or why not? Yes? The oracle's kind of like non determinism, it just, like, it just gets it right. It is, we'll compare it with non-determinism. It's almost non-determinism. In fact, we'll, we'll compare it to NP's non-determinism. But it is, in a sense, not real. It is definitely made up. And that's a, that's a good way to come at non-determinism is it's made up. And oracles are also definitely made up. Same thing. So, yes, it's somehow before you, right? You have no idea how to do it. Halt is undecidable. So you can never construct. In fact, if, if we were to go to the church during thesis level, we say we may say that a machine with Oracle access to halt is uh, unfathomable, 
you could never give a machine and an input write down the configurations of the machine because you don't know what its behavior would do. How would you simulate the Oracle? You know, you don't have access to the answers. You don't know how that works. So this is sort of the, in, the invention of the, the point of an Oracle, right? Um, do we think that M halt can, do we think there's still undecidable languages with respect to M halt? Yes. Why? Right. Yeah. Maybe a counting argument would suffice. There's still undecidably many, there's still uncountably many undecidable languages. Um, you could diagonalize over the Oracle machines that have Oracle access to halt and construct another language that they, they can't decide. Something like this may be possible. But yeah, still even given Oracle access to halt, it's not the only undecidable language. There exists uh, more. In fact, if you, keep, if you keep constructing undecidable languages and keep giving them as oracles to a machine, it, there's still always another undecidable language. That's how diagonalization basically works, right? Um, so let's consider what is called a relativized complexity class. I'm going to be so picky about these markers. Is the counting argument sufficient? Like, isn't that all you need? Like, it doesn't matter how many things you, dis you define in at all, like Oracle or not. You've only defined a countable number of them because you... Each machine has a finite description in terms of code by the typewriter principle, so I suppose, yeah. Um, a relativized complexity class... Okay, a relativized complexity class is you take a class C and you add an Oracle A to all C machines. It is the class of languages decidable by C machines. Man, I'm... Oh, there we go. C machines with... Oracle access to A, right? So in terms of you take a normal complexity class, the one that we already know, and then you surger into each machine that has that time or space bound, you surger in an Oracle, right? So you consider a different class. For example, let's consider an Oracle for SAT. So not complex computability theory, but complexity theory, okay? SAT, P SAT is the class of polyno polynomial time Turing machines, languages decidable by polynomial time Turing machines, such that each Turing machine has an oracle to SAT. We will measure the time complexity of the oracle as one. To make an oracle call takes unit time. This is actually very important. How long does it take to query the oracle? You don't count the time it takes to write it down, and you promise you won't use the oracle tape for scratch work. It takes a single unit of time for an oracle query to, to occur. That's the way we'll measure oracle time. In some sense, the difference between non-determinisms and oracles and these things weird like this is just you're using a, 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 bendy, a bendy little stopwatch, right? You, certain things take different time. Suppose you gave polynomial time Turing machines to SAT. What do we think this class contains? What's the relationship between P to the SAT and the classes we already know? Well, NP has to at least be a contained. Okay. Yeah. Before we do NP, certainly P is a subset of SAT. Why is P a subset of P SAT? Forget NP for a second. We'll come back to it in 10 seconds. Yeah. Just ignore the oracle. Every polynomial time Turing machine can be simulated on a polynomial time Oracle machine by the machine ignoring its Oracle. Think of the Oracle like API. In fact, in fact the, cybernetics, the cybernetics guys, you know, they're all Soviet Union. They were studying the same problems, but they didn't call it an Oracle with all this great lore and mythology. They called it a database. That's kind of boring, I guess, but it's the same thing. You know, just ignore the database. You ignore the API. Let me use these Silicon Valley jargons, right? P is a subset of PSAT. Um, what else, what else, what is the relationship between P, SAT, and NP? NP is a subset. Why is NP a subset of P, SAT? Because SAT is NP, like polynomial time reducible NP hard. And so you just like reduce each problem to a SAT problem and then you solve the SAT problem in your time. Yeah. Let me write it out explicitly so we make sure how, we, how this is going to work. We're going to have um, an Oracle machine M with Oracle access to SAT on input a w and this oracle machine is going to is going to simulate quote unquote the an np machine it's going to have this np machine n as its code and instead of simulating uh, n on w it's not going to do this it's not going to simulate n on w it's going to compute via the cook levin theorem some formula phi from cook levin of n comma w 
So it's going to run the Cook 11 process in polynomial time. Given the description of the machine M and this input W, it's going to output a formula phi, right? And if phi is in sat, accept. Else, reject. And we know that this formula phi is in sat if and only if um, uh, the machine accepted the word, right, by the Cook Lemon procedure. So this is a machine, this machine takes polynomial time. In fact, not only does it uh, use its oracle a polynomial amount of times, it uses its oracle exactly once. It uses, it calls the or oracle only one time. That's actually a much bigger restriction of the, than having general access to the oracle, right? It makes one oracle call. It can simulate all of NP, right? Um, what else is the relationship between NP and SAT? Do we think these are equal? Conjecture for the audience. What else do we think is contained in NP, NP to the SAT? Do we think NP equals P to the SAT? That is a probable outcome, but what is the what are the odds on that? Why not? Because you can probably use the oracle many times to figure out more things. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a I don't know about that. Maybe. Maybe an oracle could speed up. Many oracle calls could speed up something. Here's maybe the answer I was looking for, is that unlike non-determinism, an oracle is unbiased in power. Not only does is NP contained in P to the sat, but so are the complements of all NP languages. Why? Why is co-NP contained in P to the sat? Co-NP, again, is the class of languages which are the complements of the languages in NP. So sat complement... For example, is an element of P to the sat. Why? You just do the same thing again, except instead of accepting, you reject, and instead of rejecting, you accept. Sat complement, so like the oracle gives equal time for an answer to be yes or an answer to be no. It says it unbiasedly. Non-determinism will tell you an answer if it exists efficiently, but if the answer does not exist, it unfortunately has to reject on all branches. So an oracle, as we see, is bigger than NP if we believe and we should that NP does not equal co-NP. An oracle for SAT is much stronger. If you had to choose, you get one superpower, pick non-determinism or pick an oracle for SAT. You should pick the oracle for SAT because you have a bigger class. If we assume that NP does not equal co NP, right? Now, is this is it equal to NP union co NP? Uh, we also don't think that either. In fact, it's actually much bigger than that. It contains NP to the sat. No, excuse me. NP to the sat is in fact not equal to P to the sat. Turns out, um, and it turns out that so sat complement a formula is in sat if it's satisfiable, right? There's a satisfying assignment. A formula is in sat in sat complement if there is no satisfying assignment. So in some sense, the truth table of the Boolean formula has a row of all zeros. And you cannot efficiently give someone a witness to that problem, right? You have to show for all possible assignments to the things that they're all zero. There's no quick, short answer to that problem. So sat complement is, in fact, a co-NP complete problem, right? It's not efficiently, and we don't think those are equal. So an oracle, very big, messy thing, right? Very big, powerful stuff. Um, questions on an oracle? Like, uh, like exactly how to use an oracle in terms of like maybe arithmetic kind of stuff. Um, so we're not actually concerned of contrasting classic classes with relativized classes. And we call these relativized classes because they're, we were considering computation relative to an oracle, right? So rather than compare non-relativized classes with relativized classes, we actually compare what are called relativized worlds. A relativized world relativized, complexity theorists are really good at making words up, right? It's a mathematical spell world. Relativized world and our world. Our world is one where we study computation relative to an oracle, which is the empty set. So we study P versus NP 
versus p space uh, versus xp and so on. But in with a relativized world is one in which every person is walking around with an oracle in their pocket for the same class. So the relativized world, or we may, we may say the world relative to A, is we're considering all computation relative to an oracle A. P to the A, NP to the A, P space to the A, uh, XP to the A, every class, every single machine, every computation has oracle access to A. And that is the world relative to oracle A. There exists a little alternate universe where everyone keeps a, a po in their pocket a um, oracle. Okay. How many relativized worlds are there? There is a relativized world per possible language you could represent as an oracle. And therefore, there exists, since there exists uncountably many languages, each, each element of the power set of sigma star, there exists uncountably many worlds, each an alternate reality from our own, each with their own computation and definitions. So now we want to prove within each world, like how different is the structure of computation in each world? And it turns out that a lot of the theorems uh, relativize. So a, so a theorem relativizes, we'll say not a theorem, a proof relativizes. If a small modification can be made to it to hold in the presence. That's misspelled. I don't know how to spell presence. Presence of any oracle. So let's say T is a uh, some, we'll say like P is a proof. P proves some uh, uh, statement C. We say P relativizes if uh, P prime relativizes if P prime proves uh, for all oracles O, some C, C to the O, right? So basically, a proof relativizes if the proof that we have in our world can be modified ever so slightly just to hold in the presence of an oracle. We'll do some examples of this in a second. Such that basically every world then has a version of our theorem, right? So I'll give you an example. We proved, I'll call this the weak time hierarchy theorem. We proved that for you know, certain conditions on f, time constructability, and so on, we proved that time of n to the k was a strict subset of time uh, n to the k plus 1, right? Did you know that the time hierarchy theorem, in fact, relativizes? We'll prove what's called the weak time hierarchy theorem A. We'll prove that relativized time, any, according to any oracle A, is a strict subset of time n to the k is a strict subset of relativized time with oracle A of time n to the k plus 1, right? The way we'll prove this is we'll just basically copy and paste the proof of uh, the time hierarchy theorem and then just throw in an oracle. We're just going to add an oracle. The relativization, determining if a proof relativizes, relativizing a proof is a very small syntactic change. So I'll give you the proof again. Uh, we say let m1, m2 be, uh, be n to the k machines. Um, consider D on input uh, W I uh, simulate uh, M I on W I for n to the k steps, and we uh, if M I accepts uh, reject if M I rejects. Except this is, I mean, we, we did say that there's so many missing details from this. But this is the proof, right? This is it. Um, here's how we prove the relativized version of this proof. We say, uh, let, 
we're going to just diagonalize. We're going to do the same proof, but we're going to diagonalize over Oracle machines by an Oracle diagonalizer. So we're going to say let M1A, M2A be Oracle n to the k machines. And again, they all have access to the same Oracle A. We'll say d to the a on input wi simulate uh, mi to the a. And I'll say this simulate, we'll come back to this. I'm going to put an asterisk by this simulate. Simulate mi on wi for n to the k steps if mi to the a accepts, reject. If m i to the a rejects, accept. Now notice what difference I've made here. Okay, I've done the very smallest modification. I've added an oracle to our diagonalizer D. Oh, thing did not change. I've added an oracle to our diagonalizer D here. Okay, I've added an oracle. We're diagonalizing over these oracle machines. And our simulation is a little different, right? But basically, the proof is almost syntactically the same. Now, here's the question. We discussed in detail how a deterministic Turing machine can simulate other deterministic Turing machines, how this simulation occurs, right? By the Church-Turing thesis, that occurs. How does an Oracle machine simulate an Oracle machine? This is a non-trivial question. The same thing as the other simulation, but anytime the oracle is queried on the simulated machine, it queries its own oracle and then exactly. responds with the answer. Exactly. So mi to the a, and remember, a could be like the halting problem or anything weird. Okay. Mi to the a is going to perform some normal computation, like a Turing machine would. Then it'll make an oracle query. But how does the simulator know to continue the simulation? What it's going to do? It is, has access to the same oracle, so it's going to ask its own oracle for the answer, and then it's going to use that to continue the simulation. Right? Think of, again, the Oracle access to A like an API. Right? If you are running a VM, and then your software in the emulator uses an Oracle, makes an, Oracle, uh, uses, makes an API call, you, an emulator, are going to just implement the same API and make the same API, API call to continue the uh, emulation. It's sort of the same thing here. Right? Do we, that is what it means for a proof to relativize is this small modification, right? And basically, uh, here's sort of the, 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 the proofs which relativize appear to only use black box simulation of computation. So any proof that relativizes is one apparent. It's not easy, given an arbitrary proof, does this relativize or not. But in general, a gray heuristic, which works 99% of the time, basically works on anything, even papers. You can read a paper, and you'll develop a vibes-based intuition, like, yeah, that proof relativizes. A proof relativizes if it apparently only uses computation in a black box way. If the computation only occurs black box, you may modify the things being simulated and how the simulation occurs, and now the proof is relativized. This is a sufficient proof for a relativized time hierarchy theorem. Okay. Um, so we're not going to reprove every single theorem in complexity theory ever made in terms of which ones relativize and which ones don't. But let's just uh, try to sort them, like which ones do relativize. And again, by relativize, we mean an or Every world relative to the oracle, every alternate universe has their own version of that theorem. Every universe, every alternate reality relative to oracle A has its own time hierarchy theorem. The time hierarchy theorem is true in every world. You know? Let's see what theorems are and aren't relativizing. But before we do so, any questions on this, on relativization in general? What does it mean for a proof to relativize? This is in kind of the crux of today. Yes? I'm just sort of wondering if there's a, a world where your oracle you know, is doing the simulation that you want? The oracle formulized is a language. So it is just a set of strings in the most formal sense. Now, you could consider an oracle to be the language decided by some other machine. But formally, 
having Oracle access to that language means in unit time, you're not considering of the fact that this language takes so long to decide or not. It's just simply it tells you the answer immediately or not. Does that make sense? It's magic. It's magic smoke. I'm just worried about like in this proof, right? Yeah. Let's say for our one MI that would normally reject when we simulate. Uh, it would take what n to the k steps. Okay. But we instead in our simulation used the oracle, which just told us, oh, it rejects an n to the k steps immediately. What is the, what do you, so that you have to formalize what you mean by oracle tells you that it rejects an n to the k steps. Suppose we were diagonalizing specifically over p to the sat. Such a proof of this will actually show that p to the sat does not equal xp to the sat. Right? Now, we haven't even found a use for more oracle queries. But xp to the sat, you better believe, is distinct from p to the sat, simply because we have a relativized time hierarchy theorem, right? Now, in oracle, you say, maybe it tells me, uh, maybe the oracle is that language we did ehalt, something like this. That's OK. You can still diagonalize against it, create something bigger. Now, we know p and np and, and co and p are in here. It doesn't matter. Suppose we're only comparing and contrasting all relativized classes against each other, not an un unrelativized and a relativized. Right. So everyone has Oracle access to A, you know. Yeah. What do you mean that like we don't take any time to write our query either? Uh, this is a complex question, and relativizing theorems change whether or not you choose to measure the time it takes. It's a it actually should not be a machine-dependent notion, and it should not be understood as a machine-dependent notion. Unfortunately, it can only be formalized as such. So. Smarter people than me have said, you know, like, let's just pretend it doesn't take any time to write down the question. It doesn't take any, or like, the question is written down somewhere. It takes no time to copy it to the Oracle tape. It takes a single step of time to uh, call the Oracle, which will come erase your tape for you and leave a one or a zero. Like even copying down the specific sub, so the query you're making it exactly this time. Yes. But like, looking at the thing, like, let's say I want to like ask a question about a word. Like, looking at the word will take time, but then sure. writing it does not. Let's suppose even, let's, uh, I mean, in the context of considering computation relative to something, you don't want to deny a machine access to its oracle simply because the questions it asks might be too long. Can a polynomial time machine ask an exponentially long query? It sounds like no, but we should want that to be the case, it turns out. Can a polynomial time machine ask more than a polynomial amount of queries? No. That's the, re that's the, that's the bound. I see. Now, this is sort of a vibes-based thing, and people disagree on this. This is the part that's informal. This is the, one of the foundations of relativization is that it's informal. I see. But you kind of have to look at a proof and be like, yeah, that one was black box simulation. Actually, let's do that right now. Let's sort every theorem we've ever known into two categories, relativiz relativize or not. We're going to play a little game show. You also get a, a, a relativized church Turing thesis where you assume ah. that the, the person himself must also have an oracle. If the brain that we're simulate that we, we're, we're, we perform a reduction from a, a brain into a Turing machine, if we perform a reduction from a relativized brain that has Oracle access to A. I'm not sure what that formalization occurs as, but maybe. Because then that makes things nice. Because like definitely I could simulate that. Because if I had the Oracle, I could do it. Yes. You may think an Oracle machine may simulate another with the same Oracle. That's fine. You had a question? The ancient Greeks who did have Oracles were truly smarter than us. That explains a lot about. Yeah. OK, um, I'm going to give you uh, some theorems. You tell me if they relativize or don't, OK? Um, P is a subset of NP. Relativizes or doesn't relativize? This is difficult. P, subset of NP, relativizes or doesn't relativize? Think back what the proof that P is a subset of NP was. We just said that every deterministic Turing machine is a non-deterministic one. What we really did was we simulated a deterministic Turing machine on a non-deterministic one, in some sense. We would call that to be a relativizing proof. P is a subset of NP is a relativizing proof. Okay? That proof is true. The version of P in uh, every world 
is a subset of their version of NP in a big world. Okay. Um, same thing with NP and P space and most obvious containments that involve simple, simple simulations, right? Um, um, NP being non-deterministic polynomial time and also verifiable, deterministic verifiable computation. Relativizes or doesn't? NP equals NPV, right? Relativizes or doesn't? Well, recall the proof that NP is not equal NPV. Basically, we gave two machines, they simulated each other. So that one relativizes. Um, I'll go a little faster. Halt being undecidable relativizes? Definitely, it can't. It was diagonalization, so yes. Wait, but what about the world where I have an oracle for Halt? Um, then the oracle version of Halt is undecidable. The relativized halting problem is undecidable, yeah. Uh, and general diagonalization proves all relativized, right? Okay. Um, so there can't be an oracle, like there cannot be a language. If the proof relativizes. Let's give an example of a non-relativizing proof. I'll tell you right now, Cook 11, debatably so, but probably does not relativize. You take a computation, you inspect it intrinsically, and you convert it into a formula. That's not computation in a black box way. That's dealing very deeply into the weeds of the computation. And it's not even sure what it means to convert an Oracle Turing machine into a Oracle formula, because that Oracle formula would need to have like Oracle gates or something, and then like, you know, that's not, that's weird. So like, okay, that doesn't work. Same thing with TQBF. TQBF is P-space complete. P-space, I'll even say P-space hard. That was probably just a variant of Cook 11, right? So those proofs don't appear to relativize. Um, I'll tell you the rest of them. Uh, hierarchy theorems, they relativize. Uh, Leibniz theorem relativizes. Uh, Savage's theorem relativizes. Basically, like, 99% of theorems you can think of, every single theorem relativizes. And only, like, two of them we can name probably don't relativize. So the point of relativization is actually, we're not concerned with, like, you know, what is going on in these worlds? What's, we're not concerned about what, what, looking at our world, what we can say about those worlds. We're actually concerned with the contrapositive, right? So... Uh, the way we formalize relativization is like if the proof of C relativizes, that implies that for all oracles O, that the statement C of O is true, right? But a notion about proof implies a notion about truth. And this is, again, C is some complexity theoretic statement, right? Whatever it is. Um, the contrapositive of this is that for all oracles O, C of O is false, or the negation of this is not true. For, um, that implies uh, no, uh, C has no relativizing proof. The way you say that uh, for Oracle, all oracles O, C of O is false, uh, what you mean is there exists some A and B such that C to the A is true, but C to the B is false. And that will imply that C has no relativizing proof. This is the crux of today. Given a complexity theoretic statement, if you can tr prove that there is one of these worlds that the theorem is true for, and there is a different world that the theorem is false for, then the theorem in our world has no relativizing proof. If a proof is relativizing, it's a special notion of generalization. A proof is relativizing if it can be generalized easily to hold in the presence of an oracle. But if there exists what we would say contradictory relativizations, one where it's true and one where it's, where it's false, then no such proof, of course, can generalize to all worlds. So no such proof is so generalizing, and so a proof of this certain specific syntax cannot exist. That is the point of relativization. What we will prove is, in fact, 
uh, p equaling np or not has no uh, relativizing proof. This is the evidence, but perhaps not proof, that we take that p versus np is a hard problem. If all of these theorems have relativizing proofs, and like every technique we can think of except some of the mechanical programming ones, if all of them have relativizing proofs, and we know p versus np has no relativizing proof, then the techniques developed in all of these theorems are useless. None of these are going to apply to p does not equal np. We have encountered the first barrier to the problem historically. 1975, or even a little bit before and after, people thought the problem was solvable. You know, Avi Wigderson, he just won the Turing Award. He, there was some anecdote um, that said, like, in the 1980s, he was like, yeah, I'll probably spend a few weeks working on the problem. People didn't realize how hard the problem was. But now we have the first historic piece of evidence that the problem is going to be hard. The problem is not going to involve very simple, trivial black box simulation proofs. All the proof techniques we've done previously, none of them will resolve p does not equal np. And whatever technique will resolve p does not equal np, if even, one's in, even one such exists, is uh, we have no idea what it looks like. We have, no, we, we have no idea what the proof can look like. We know very well, though, how, what the proof can't look like. This is the point of relativization. Right? Questions on this? Do, all, do, you all, do we all understand the point of relativization? So we, are, we just need to give an oracle A and B such that uh, P to the A is equal to NP to the A, and P to the B does not equal NP to the B. Now, there's uncountably many worlds. We just need to go find two of them that are different, and we shall do so. That's the, what we'll next prove is called the Baker, Gill, and Solovey theorem, is they give oracle, explicit oracles A and B for this to be true. Now, again, um, you may take the relativization barrier as a independence result. Because what this says is not that there is no proof that p does not equal np, but there is no proof of a certain structure, right? Now, what that structure is, unfortunately, is kind of vibes-based, because we don't really have a good heuristic. We, don't have, we only have heuristic and not formal theory about when, when a proof relativizes or not. And I'll tell you, historically, people try to formalize like exactly when a proof relativizes with an axiomatic system or doesn't. Act. And it's a, it's a hard-to-capture notion in such attempts have ended in failure. People have tried to create a set of axioms such that every proof from those axioms is a relativizing proof, and therefore p does not equal np cannot be proved from those axioms. Something like this has been attempted several times, actually. And those attempts have all had, they've been, they've been controversial, and they've ended in failure. So uh, we'll talk more about the theorem, like the importance of the theorem. But first, let's prove that it has no relativizing proof. Questions before we begin? OK, we need to prove. Uh, some oracle A exists such that P to the A is equal to NP to the A, right? Now, adding an oracle uh, lifts the class in some sense, right? Adding an oracle can only give power. So let's try to lift A, P, and NP to the same level. Like, let's give a certain amount of power such that when we lift these two classes to the same level, they are, in fact, equal, right? So what is a class that we think they should be equal at if we were to lift them? Sat. Sat. So let's say A is sat. P. Ah, I will tell you uh, we have evidence and also can't prove that if P to the sat, uh, oh God, P to the sat, whether or not P to the sat equals NP to the sat also has no relativizing proof. So in fact, that problem turns out to be as hard as P does not equal NP. In fact, if P to the sat does not equal NP to the sat, you've proved P does not equal P space. So such a proof is beyond us, but you're close. What is a class that we know that non-determinism perhaps has no power in? Or at least a class that perhaps is closed under complement. What we're going to do is we're going to lift p to the a and np to the a to the same level. And that level will be p space. If we give them a p space complete problem, we can apply Savage's theorem. So what it'll be is a is going to be tqbf, a complete problem for p space. Right? tqbf is uh, 
um, a P space complete problem, right? First direction, P TQBF, is a subset of NP TQBF. Why? Or non deterministic. Take the deterministic Oracle machine, simulate it on a non deterministic Oracle machine, and there we go. So let's prove the other way. The other way is going to be more challenging. NP to the TQBF. Oh god. Okay. So this is a this is the the machines in here have two superpowers which they may use in tandem to achieve even more than the powers individually. This is a machine with a biased power of non-determinism. It has a polynomial time bound measured both non-deterministically and oracle time, okay? It also has non-determinism and it has an oracle, okay? Let's it has those two powers. So this is a weird class, first of all. Second of all, let's just simulate this without the oracle, OK? If we want, uh, I'll say this is 1, OK? Uh, simulate uh, uh, the NP to the TQBF machine replacing Oracle calls with an algorithm for TQBF. Now, what is the runtime or the complexity of an algorithm for TQBF? Do we remember? Exponential. In time. What about space? Yes, it was polynomial space. So our simulated machine is going to run in polynomial space. How do we simulate the non-determinism? We could try to deterministically simulate it, or we can just keep the non-determinism. So what we're going to do is create a non-deterministic polynomial space machine to simulate the non-deterministic polynomial time oracle machine. It replaces the oracle calls by algorithms by algorithms, which run in polynomial space. This machine uses polynomial time, and it also therefore runs in polynomial space. And it simulates the non-determinism with the non-determinism. Okay? So we know that NP to the TQBF is a subset of NP space. Do we agree? What is NP space equal to? P space. Why? Uh, the one theorem with the square that I don't remember the name of. Savage's theorem, Walter Savage. P space equals NP equals P space. Now, why is P space, I will just finish this for you. P space, I claim, is a subset of P to the TQBF. Why is that true? Because TQBF is P space complete. Yes. Here's basically how it works, is you have like M to the TQBF, on input, uh, it was the same reason that uh, NP was a subset of P to the sat, right? Um, it's going to have the, some hard-coded machine M here. We'll call it P, which is a, we'll call it uh, S for some P-space machine, PS for some P-space machine. It's going to create some TQBF and, uh, formula from this reduction that we did, right? And then if... It does it in a single oracle call, right? So you simulate the P-space machine in polynomial time with oracle access to TQBF by computing the reduction and then just checking if the formula it works or not. Okay? So great, we've proven the world, in fact, the most important world, relative to oracle A, uh, which is TQBF, P equals NP. We proved P equals NP in one of those worlds. Now, any questions on this proof? Sort of a chain of command here. Let's do the reverse way. Um, we need to prove that there exists an oracle B such that P to the B does not equal NP to the B, right? Now, we want to prove that these two classes are different. But it should be hard to prove the classes are different given the fact that we can't prove P does not equal NP. So how are we going to separate P from N P to the B from NP to the B? Basically, 
Um, we cannot prove P does not equal NP via diagonalization, but we can prove P to the B does not equal N to P to the B by diagonalization. Ironically, we can prove that P to the B, P to, we can prove that P does not equal N, P, we can prove P equals N, P has no proof by diagonalization, by diagonalization. So the irony is not lost here, but the oracle will allow us to diagonalize against it. What we're going to do is construct this language L that requires exponentially many oracle queries uh, to decide correctly. It's going to be some unary strings, one to the n, such that b contains a unary, a string of length n, right? Another way to word this is like one to the n is an element uh, one to the n is an element of lb if and only if uh, b contains a string of length n. Um, b is an oracle, okay? It's not fixed beforehand and then we determine the computation. We're actually going to keep changing by diagonalization. We're going to keep changing what the oracle is going to say. The oracle is going to keep changing its answers in order to make all the machines wrong. If, it, if something gets too close to trying to decide it, it's going to keep changing its answers. It's not going to violate any consistency or anything. It's just going to make sure that it answers in such a way that all the machines that, tries to, that try to ask it questions will be incorrect. Now, how many strings of length n are there? Countably many. Or wait, like strings in general? Strings of length n, fixed yeah, n. Fixed n? Oh, finite. Another bound. Uh, Two to the n. Uh, uh, if mi to the b runs in time n to the i, which is strictly less than two to the n, it won't have time to query all strings of length n. So we will use that fact to ensure that each Turing machine, each Oracle machine is incorrect because they won't have time to ask all the questions. To correctly decide this language requires more than a polynomial amount of time because there's more than a polynomial amount of questions to ask because LB is dependent upon the oracle. There's no way to decide LB through some, through some algorithm or something smart. You have to go through the oracle. And you are forced to, by correctness, to make exponentially many oracle queries. And unfortunately, polynomial time oracle machines can't do that. So that's sort of the idea of the proof. Um, let's begin. Uh, let uh, M1 be M2 be, be uh, an enumeration of uh, P to the B machines. Uh, suppose they are weakly sorted such that M I to the B halts uh, in time uh, N to the I. Now that is not something that you can assume, okay? Like the ith machine halts in I N to the I time, but I don't care. It's fine. I mean, like the details around that are the same way we fix the time hierarchy theorem, or we diagonalize infinitely often, and all these kind of tricks, right? But we'll make that assumption to be fair. Any, any, um, anyone want to fight over that? It's good. Where are we picking B to be? Like something that's su suitably random oh. that you can't, like something. We will define B in stages such that. Stage I ensures uh, M I to the B does not decide uh, L B. Stage zero, uh, B is equal to the empty set. So we're going to build B up as a sequence of stages. And B is going to be basically diagonalizing over the oracle queries of the machine to ensure that all of them are incorrect. We're gonna, now, each machine will make different oracle queries. We don't know what the, what the machine does. But we're going to ensure that the machines are incorrect. right? So suppose we're at stage i, OK? This, this is the fairly technical part. If we're at stage i, um, some strings 
have been declared uh, are in and not in B. Okay? We have gone through a sequence of stages. We've made declarations. Some strings have been declared to be in B. Some strings have been declared not to be in B. Right? So we're at some finitely many strings have been declared to be in B and not in B. Now what we're going to do is uh, if uh, W is uh, the longest string in B, choose some N such that uh, N is greater than the longest current word and uh, 2 to the N is greater than N to the I. Right? So we're not diagonalizing over against the ith machine against the ith word. We're diagonalizing the ith machine against some set of n strings much larger than the current longest string in B. So each machine is diagonalized against a window of strings, perhaps much, much longer than the machine, right? Than its index, much greater. And eventually, it's enough to ensure that each string is wrong, each machine will be wrong on one input, right? Um, So we're going to uh, we're going to run uh, uh, m i to the b on uh, one to the n and record all Oracle queries. Uh, there's two cases. If it asks on a string undetermined. Uh, declare the string out of B. So that means it says no. Um, if it asks on a determined string, one that has already been declared to be in B or not in B, respond consistently. That's how the simulation of mi to the b, uh, mi on Oracle b with Oracle access to b will occur. Uh, if mi on b one to the n accepts, declare all two to the n strings of length n uh, to be to not be in Oracle B. So if the machine accepts 1 to the n, we'll make sure that uh, B does not contain a single string of length n. And if m i to the B, 1 to the n, uh, rejects, it did so in n to the i, which is strictly less than 2 to the n time. So choose a string. It did not have time to query and declare this to be in a B. For both cases, we see that 1 to the n is an element of L of B if and only if uh, m i on B on input 1 to the n rejects. And similarly, 1 to the n is not an element of LB if and only if mi with Oracle access to B on 1 to the n accepts. Either way, we see, uh, importantly, that LB is not decided by any polynomial time Oracle machine, so LB is not an element of P to the B, QED. We diagonalized against the Oracle machines. Uh, we made sure each one was incorrect. You know, random polynomial time, if it rejects, we choose a string. It did not have time to query. We put that in the oracle to make 1 to the n be an element of L of the b to make the machine incorrect. Because it's it rejected, but 1 to the n is actually in L of b. Now, if the machine accepted, we just say all the strings are going to look like nothing. Practically, the oracle is going to ask a bunch of questions. Who knows what the computation actually does? It's going to get a bunch of no answers. Let's say it tries to ask questions about 1 to the n. It's going to get 25 no answers. It's going to have, but there's going to be 32 strings. It's not going to know uh, several questions. It's going to have several unanswered questions. 
So unfortunately, it's got to make its best guess and just try to output something. And unfortunately, we'll ensure that whatever it outputs will be incorrect. So we can see L of the B is not, excuse me, not an element of P to the B. Now, we finished the hard part of the proof. Uh, any questions on the diagonalization step? Uh, why is LB an element of LB an element of NP to the B? Give me a non-deterministic polytime oracle algorithm to decide LB. Generate all, like non deterministically generate all strings. And then queer, like, like you could have like a non deterministic like subroutine, which like generates all strings of like n, queries them all, and then returns an accept if at least like one of them was in b. I would not fault you for not knowing how to program a non deterministic Turing machine because the thing, a non deterministic Oracle machine isn't real. But to basically, that's basically it. To, to reword it, you have non-determinism, you have an oracle, use the non-determinism on the oracle, yeah. use non-determinism to non-deterministically guess what oracle queries to make. You don't have to brute force search over the, to the n strings, you just know which correct strings to ask on. Same thing. So the ni, uh, a b to the machine can do so. It can just ask which strings, to, it can just, if the string, if the strings exist, it'll know which strings uh, to ask upon the oracle, because the it finds the branch if the computation exists, and the computation exists if the string exists, you right? Auto reject if your input is not one to the end. You could suppose it's formalized in such a way, like it, it non determinately non guesses that such a string is or is not there, or something like this, right? It only needs to needs to accept po in polynomial time if this answer exists, right? So, so anyway, p versus np surprising result coming out of almost nothing. This theory of oracles somehow applies to the unrelativized world that p does not equal np. Crazy that we know two things. First off, the problem is hard. We know how hard p does not equal np is. By the way, if you ever read a paper on the internet that says p equals np or p does not equal np, the reason people throw those in the garbage immediately is part of this theorem. They say, oh, well, I mean, that relativizes, obviously, into the garbage. If there's not other obvious mistakes, people try and fail with relativizing proofs all the time. Because every proof you've ever done might be a relativizing one, you know? Um, two, it's I think it's incredibly ironic that we were able to prove there is no pr diagonalization proof of P at versus NP. We were able to prove that no such proof exists by diagonalizing P from, by diagonalization, you know? We were able to separate P to the B from NP to the B by diagonalization, and the implication of that is that you cannot show P equals NP by diagonalization, right? We've given two contradictory relativizations. We've given the world relative to TQBF and the world relative to this uh, oracle such that P does not equal NP, right? Questions? One final theorem I'll mention in brief is that uh, relative to a random oracle, let's say the strings in B are chosen uniformly random, we can prove that P does not equal NP with probability one. In fact, uh, what you can do is use non-determinism to guess a, guess a pattern in the randomness, and then the polynomial time machine, unfortunately, has to brute force search over the randomness. Something like this is true. So you can do some measure theory. You could prove that such a thing will exist. All right. Questions? Good. <laughs>